Hey there, Detroit sports fanatics, and welcome to episode 170 of the Detroit Sports Truth on Spreaker. Lots to get to here on this podcast, but first... Touchdown, Detroit Lions! The Lions get routed by the Arizona Cardinals 42-17 to at Ford Field in Week 5. They go 0-5. That is very good for the hashtag streaky for Kendichi. That is Robert Kendichi, the junior defensive tackle from the Ole Miss Rebels. He is the he is projected to be their first overall pick in the 2016 NFL draft. My co-host Ed Smith on the DST on Blog Talk Radio recommended it to me and all the Lions fans everywhere. He suggested that the Lions tank and go 0-16 and get Robert Kandichi. That's why his hashtag is streaky for Kandichi. Lions jumped out to a 7-0 lead, but then they fell behind 28-7 at halftime, then 35-7 in the third quarter, 35-10, and then 42-10, and then 42-17. Matthew Stafford was benched after three quarters, throwing three interceptions. He's taking more of the blame than his offensive line, perhaps. But still, it's the entire offense's fault, not just Stafford's. The offensive line isn't helping him. Joe Lombardi isn't calling much or correct plays. Jim Caldwell is not even help, helping much of the offense. Not even Matthew Stafford whom Jim Caldwell used to work with in the past. I think that uh, that that game was a, a meltdown for the Lions, who were trying to win, if they were trying to win, to finally get their first win of the season, which we are not hoping for. We here at the DST, along with the Detroit Sports Rag, are hoping they could go on 16, which probably won't happen. Probably 4 and 12, 3 and 13, maybe 5 and 11. That, that's just about it, as we project for the Lions to finish this 2015 season. Matthew Stafford. Uh, blew up, I get it. But here's where the here's the part where Jim Caldwell pulling Matthew Stafford is illogical. Dan Orlovsky is worse than Matthew Stafford. There's no backup quarterback that could back him up. Orlovsky is uh, the only quarterback that the Lions have right now. And he only threw one touchdown and, didn't, and did not get much going. His touchdown did not come until very, very late in the fourth quarter. But before then, the Lions only settled for one field goal by Matt Prater. Just one freaking field goal. Which uh, brings me to this. Everybody's job on the sideline, except for defensive coordinator Terrell Austin's job, and in the front office, could and should be in jeopardy after this loss, after this debacle, after this mess. Sunday late afternoon at Ford Field in downtown Detroit. <clears throat> Across from Comerica Park. Uh, thanks, Todd Morris. I, 
here's why I don't think it's Terrell Austin's fault, or or much thereof. It's it's uh, as very little as I like to make excuses on my own show. I have to admit that the defense is not even compared to the defense they used to have with Ndamukong Sue and Nick Fairley and C.J. Mosley from here from this season forward they're both they're all gone Sue's in Miami Fairley's in St. Louis Mosley is I don't know I don't remember where he is admittedly but uh, the defense had done very well for the first four games until week five when the Cardinals offense just tore them up. The Cardinals are a very, very, very tough team. They lead the they led the NFC West going into that contest and The Lions defense somehow imploded after their offense gave them a 7 nothing lead to work with. The defense just couldn't get off the field. Too many penalties by the defense. Too many turnovers and penalties by the offense. The coaching, most of the coaching staff is... Uh, not being held, not holding themselves accountable. And not even Terrell Austin was uh, holding himself accountable in that 30, in that 42 10 dump. I mean, if you want to win a championship, then this is completely unacceptable. But if you want to lose, then it's not. You want to go on 0 and 16 streaky for Kandichi, it's not acceptable at all. I was going to touch on everybody in the front office, including General Manager Martin Mayu and President Tom Lewan, who admittedly got arrested for drunk driving two off-seasons ago before Jim Caldwell was even introduced as their newest head coach in the beginning of 2014, the calendar year, after Jim Schwartz got fired along with his uh, dysfunctional regime Scott Linehan and Gunther Cunningham. Jim Caldwell chose Joe Lombardi and and Terrell Austin as his offensive and defensive coordinators. And in 2014 they finished 11 and 6 ending with a tragic, controversial, and 24-20 loss to the Dallas Cowboys in the NFC wildcard playoff game. In one of them. In one of them. Let me take a sip of water here. Uh, Martin Mayhew is has done a very poor job overall drafting players like like Kyle Van Noy, who is very injury prone. Also, uh, uh, oh, 
thinking Titus Young or and Dominic and Sue who was drafted he he was a a major troublemaker on and off the field he got fines everywhere he rarely got he rarely or never got suspended I think the Lions in the league started being too fair to uh, coddling, so to speak. And uh, Mayhew, Mayhew and a lot, Mayhew, Mayhew and Luan are not taking much accountability. For these, they they just let it let it roll. William Clay Ford Sr. before he died chose Mayu and Luan to be the general manager and president to take their respective positions, and so far they've only made it to the playoffs twice in. One, two, three, four, seven. Going on eight years now. Seven thus far. Going on eight years since the Lions are now 0-5. They have the Chicago Bears uh, thumping into town this upcoming Sunday at 1 on Fox at Fort Field. The Chicago Bears proved to be a very struggling team, by the way. The Lions have a much better chance to win that, to finally get their first win of the season. But I just want to uh, point out that, that after William Clay Ford senior died only Martha Ford William Bill Senior's wife was left with the ownership herself Bill Ford Senior is the uh, Bill, Bill, Bill Ford Junior was right behind Martha Ford and Martha Ford owning the Lions is something in an article that Jeff Moss wrote earlier Monday headlining who is running the Lions and why did Luis Luis Perez resign I'm going to read that out to you loud I'm going to read that out to you read it out loud to you for months now, I have Jeff has used both this space, this space, and his Twitter feed to mock the notion that the Detroit Lions are actually being run by the widow of William Clay Ford Sr. That's Martha Ford. But based on recent public comments by Bill Ford Jr. and I give Jeff Moss credit, by the way, full credit, and on inside information the DSR has gleaned, we are family certain that Ford Jr. has has indeed been Denise Illiched out of Allen Park. There are three key pieces of information to contemplate when considering who is actually calling the shots for this pathetic 0-5 organization. A lot of it is already in the public domain. Here is what we know. Number one, in an interview last week on WJR, Ford Jr. stated the following. That's 760 a.m. in Detroit. Quote, she, Martha Ford, is in charge. She absolutely is. Since my father passed away over a year ago, my mother is in charge, and she makes all the decisions, unquote. Many Lions fans have been incredulous that a 90-year-old woman who never said boo about the franchise when her husband was alive could actually be running the show, but it appears to be true. Even though Ford Jr. has been a ghost lately when it comes to the Lions, 
even though Martha is now at league meetings representing the team, even though Jim Caldwell referenced her specifically as being upset enough over the referee error in Seattle to complain to the NFL, even though the team, the team's website, Jeff Moss calls it the propaganda website, which is lying, has gone to great lengths to make it appear as though Martha is in control. Most Lions fans refuse to accept this information at face value. And why should they? And why should they? It is preposterous that Ford Jr., a man who once navigated Ford Motor Company out of peril, has been passed over for an elderly woman born at third base who must think she hit a triple up the gap. In fact, the only contribution for from Martha Ford between 1963 and 2014 regarding the Lions was her edict to William Clay Ford Sr. that the team could not have cheerleaders. That's the sum total of her involvement prior to the old man kicking it. I guess Martha Ford's mind is telling her and us that there's too much Lions tradition. Old, old Lions tradition. Number two... On September 1st, 2015, Detroit news beat writer Josh Katzenstein for the Lions posted an article stating that Lions CFO, Chief Financial Officer, Luis Perez had resigned from his post. Who is Luis Perez? Well, he was a well-respected sports executive and not another Ford family leech. This is lifted directly from Katzenstein's article. Quote, one of the team's senior vice presidents, the Lions hired Perez in 2011 after he'd spent the previous seven years at Model Ventures, Model Ventures. He also had more than a decade of experience in professional sports, working for teams like the New York Knicks, New York Rangers, Philadelphia Phillies, and Baltimore Ravens, unquote. So why did one of the franchise's senior execs and an outside voice at that at that quit on the verge of a, the 2015 NFL season commencing? Number three, here is where it gets very interesting. A source close to the situation has advised us that Perez was fed up with the direction of the team. And which direction was that? One without Bill, Bill Ford Jr., The DSR has been told that when Martha Ford took over the reins from her deceased husband, she decided that Bill Ford Jr. had enough on his plate with his responsibilities at FOMOCO. <clears throat> Furthermore, two of Bill Ford's sisters had absolutely nothing going on at all, so Martha decided to become the team's decision maker with those two daughters assisting her in running a billion-dollar operation. In parentheses, Bill has three sisters. They are Martha Park Morse, Sheila Firestone Hamp, and Elizabeth Hudson Ford. We have not yet been able to confirm which two of the three are in the cabal with Martha to shut Bill out. We are working on it. Uh, going out of parentheses here, hopefully that Justin Spiro and the other gang at the DSR could work can work harder on that. Try to get something on that, please do. Jeff Moss is hoping so. If he has to do it himself, so be it. So believe Bill Ford Jr. when he states that he isn't in power. He is telling the truth and is not happy about it. The Detroit sports truth, that is. Thank you very much, Bill Ford Jr. For many years, Lions fans held out hope that once William Ford Sr. died, Bill Jr. would come in as our knight in shining armor and run this organization as a real professional outfit and not as some dysfunctional family business Man by drunk friends like Tom Luan 
the president of the Lions of the old man. The example of the death of Bill Wirtz and the ascension of Rocky Wirtz in Chicago with the recent thrice Stanley Cup champion Blackhawks was mentioned again and again. And even though that idea has lost some of its luster, Ford Jr.'s hand Ford Jr.'s hand in the Matt Millen era certainly was an ominous, an ominous sign. There were still many Lions fans holding out hope that the kid with a brain would be our salvation. Apparently, Ford Jr. has never even had the chance to become the the next Rocky Wirtz. Instead, he has been usurped by his mother usurped by his mother who was born before the Great Depression and by two of his sisters who it would appear needed a hobby. I guess yoga classes and Mahjong weren't doing the trick. And team president Tom Luan's role in all this? We are told by a source that Luan knows the franchise should be under Bill Ford Jr.'s control but Luan is more worried about saving his own job that he is doing that he is about doing the right thing. So he is supposedly in major ass-kissing mode. And you thought the team on the field was a mess? Eh, wrong. Illogical. Fans thinking the team on the field is a mess. Are you out of your mind? It's the team, it's, it's the, it's the people in the front office that were always dysfunctional since they were first hired. Each and every single one of those people. The Fords, the Luans, the Mayus, everybody in the front office. Even those behind the front office guys that we know as popular public figure idols for this front for this dump of a franchise. And um, one last thing, Golden Tate was whining and complaining about Lions fans leaving the game early. You're just a crybaby, a coward! Fans had to leave not only because that game was a blowout on the wrong end, but also the team was 0-4 going into that game, now 0-5, and the fans couldn't take it any longer. The fans have a point. Golden Tate does not. Are you out of your mind? Yeah, Golden Tate is out of his mind. Tate is complaining about the same way Justin Verlander complained about the Tigers fans not being positive after Brian Osmus pulled him for giving up a two-out single in a meaningless regular season game when the Tigers had a terrible losing record. You're just a crybaby, a coward! Let me tell you this one last time. Players shouldn't talk about their team's fans in a negative way whatsoever when the fans are paying their earned keep to see a game and wanting to see their teams win. Done deal, pal. That's unacceptable. The players are letting the fans down constantly, period. I've said this almost ten times now. It's got to stop. Back to Jim Caldwell. But uh, actually, actually uh, we're going to stay with Golden Tate here and the fans. The fans were filing up the entire Ford Field Stadium in the first stages of the game. But when the but when the Lions start getting blown out by the Arizona Cardinals, the fans left early. And they had the correct exact reason to. And Golden Tate's whining about it? Come on. You're just a crybaby, a coward! This is, uh, this, 
team, this organization is not only dysfunctional on the field, but dysfunctional in the front office. It's equally dysfunctional as a whole and completely as well. What in the world are we going to do with the Detroit Lions and the Tigers? I'll get to them later at the end of my podcast here. So, uh, moving on to the Red Wings. The Red Wings blanked the, the Toronto Maple Leafs, Mike Babcock's new team, 4 nothing under, under new head coach Jeff Blaschel. Just an ablocator scored a hat trick. Dylan Larkin picked up his first NHL goal and assist. <laughs> Henrik Zetterberg picked up three assists. <laughs> and Jimmy Howard posted a shutout, making 21 saves. Then the Red Wings, the next night, allowed 46 shots on goal and still held on to beat the Carolina Hurricanes 4-3 to three on the road. <laughs> Timu Polkinen scored two goals. <laughs> Henrik Zetterberg and oh, can't remember. Uh, Justin Abdelkader got the other goals for Detroit. <laughs> Peter Mrazek made 43 saves. The Red Wings were outshot 18-2 in the first period and 34-8 after two periods, as Mickey Redmond pointed out on the Red Wings Live post-game show at that night uh, hosted by Johnny Kane, Darren Elliott, and Chris Osgood. You can catch them on Red Wings Live on the on pre-game and post-game and during intermissions as well. Ken Daniels and Mickey Redman usually doing... Uh, 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 not usually, but... Doing all home game, uh, calling all home games in the booth. Mickey Redmond can uh, call even more uh, road games in the Eastern Conference now, since the Red Wings are in the Eastern Conference. While Chris Osgood can be the backup, Chris Osgood is the backup comment color commentator for the rest of the road games, especially in the Western, especially all in the Western Conference. Uh, not all of them. Mickey Redmond is, could, could be in Chicago unless it's on, on NBCSN, on cable or satellite. Jason Day walking on Twitter asks, how long have you had the nickname Gator? Since 1995, Jason. But uh, I want to point out that the Red Wings power play is one for five since the opening two minutes of their regular season when they when they scored on their first power play the, the opening 12 seconds or so, in fact, of the regular season. And Justin Ablocator uh, scored on, on a putback past uh, Jonathan Bernier.
But since then... Since then, the Red Wings have uh, failed to capitalize the last four uh, on the last four opportunities. They did. They um, uh, head coach Jeff Blaschel considered putting Brendan Smith on the power play, which could help their offense a bit more. But so far, I ha- I know it's only two games in, but so far. It hasn't helped much. Again, I I just pointed out the Red Wings' power play is one for five, not the best power play you can have. It's uh, not good either. It's very bad. The Red Wings need to. The Red Wings' power play unit needs to pick it up. <clears throat> But uh, Dylan Larkin picked up an assist, an, an additional assist in Carolina. He, so Larkin has one goal and two assists. Zetterberg has one goal and four assists. Abdelkader has four goals thus far. Let me check the stats right here. Right here. Now, oh, wait a minute. Looking at regular season stats here, DetroitRedWings.com. Justin Ablocator has four goals, one assist. Polkinen's got two goals. That's it. Larkin, a goal and two assists. Kyle Quincy, Mike Green, Johan Franzen, Jakob Kindle, Gustav Nyquist, and Tomas Tatar with only an assist each. The rest are blank. Brad Richards is was expected to uh, help get the offense going. Thus far, he has nothing and a minus one. Only two shots on goal. Dylan Larkin leads the team in shots on goal with 10. Ablocator with five. Zetterberg and Franzen and, and, for, and Landon Ferraro and Luke Glendening with three. Brad Richards, Tomas Tatar, and, and Gus Nyquist with two. Kyle Quincy. And Jakob Kindle with one. Same for Brendan Smith. The rest are blank. Abdul Kader has both game-winning goals for the first two games of the season. The Red Wings... Right now... Stand in third place... In the Eastern Conference, the Atlantic Division, the, the they stand in third place in the Atlantic Division. The Tampa Bay Lightning, their next opponent on NBCSN Tuesday at 7:30 at Joe Louis Arena. The Lightning are three and zero with six for six points. Same for the Montreal Canadiens in a tie for first place. The Rangers are three and zero as well, leading the Metropolitan Division. So it's a three-way tie. For first place in the Eastern Conference, the Wings are 2-0 and with four points. They stand alone in fourth place in the fourth seed in the East, followed by the Ottawa Senators, 2-1-0 with four points. The New York Islanders and the Philadelphia Flyers are one one and one with three points. The Washington Capitals have only played one game and, and won it. They've got two points. The Florida Panthers are thus far out out of the playoff picture, but they they've got two points as well. They're one one and zero. Oh. 
The Saber, the Buffalo Sabers, are one and one, two and zero, oh, with two points. The Maple Leafs have only one point, zero oh, two and one. They, uh, they still have yet to pick up a win. The Carolina Hurricanes, the Pittsburgh Penguins, obviously with Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin, and the New Jersey Devils, the Columbus Blue Jackets, and the Boston Bruins have nothing. Hurricanes and Penguins and Devils are 0-2-0. The Blue Jackets and Bruins are 0-3-0. Ouch. I just got word that the Red Wings and 97 won the ticket have signed a new broadcast deal. Which uh, hurts on one side. The talk show hosts like Pat Caputo, Dennis Fithian, Mike Villani, Terry Foster, Doug Karsh, Scott Anderson, Sarah Stone, Bill Stone. Uh, I mean, uh, Michael Stone, Bill McAllister, Dan Leach, Jeff Rieger, the program director, James Powers talk about crap that nobody wants to care about and and most of the hosts most or all of the hosts have uh, very little knowledge and are thus homers who just cater to company men don't even who don't even know what the hell is going on But a broadcast deal has been done with the Detroit Red Wings and 97 won the ticket in Southfield in the metro Detroit area. So, Uh, moving on here, uh, the Red Wings play the Hurricanes again on Wednesday at 7.30 at the Joe. I guess, uh, 97 1 was the wing's only choice. Are you out of your mind? I know, I feel you, but. But, you know, we got to stick to it. There's nothing else sweet. the wings can find for a radio station to cover them. So, moving on to the Pistons. And Rashid from long range. Ah! Yeah! Left side line, three, and he answers. Pistons finally win a preseason game. They smashed the Bucks in Milwaukee Saturday night, 117-88. to Marcus Morris, one of the new Pistons, led Detroit in scoring with 21 points. The Pistons played better defense, and they, they scorched the Bucks on offense. Oh, with their powerful offense, as we expected, they're one and two, and may and that win may be a sign, be an early sign of things to come for the Pistons, because if they keep that up against the Pacers in Indiana Tuesday night and the Bulls in Chicago on Wednesday night and so on and so forth, they'll be a more difficult force to be reckoned with this upcoming NBA season. Pistons uh, have a very, have a very uh, offensive uh, roster with 
with Aaron Baines, Steve Blake, Marcus Morris, Reggie Bullock, Reggie Jackson, Brandon Jennings, Andre Drummond, their defensive weapon, Ersan Eliasova, They had to give up Greg Monroe to the Bucks for Ilya Sova. And uh, it, it, the 0 2 star was just rough, but the win, the hard earned win, I think will motivate the Pistons from the rest from the from the rest of this preseason on out from here on out so we expect them to reach the 7th seed and finish there just about right there and we don't know how far they're going to go probably not too far but they'll make the playoffs it's still quite a development they they just need to uh work more on their defense like they did in Milwaukee Saturday night allowing just 88 points still a still a little bit of room for improvement so moving on to college football I posted an article on my sports page, Taylor Phillips's Detroit sports page, that Michigan is favored to beat Michigan State this upcoming Saturday. The Wolverines have shut out their last three opponents. After starting one and one, they started their season with a 24-17 loss at Utah, and then they routed the Oregon State Beavers 35-7. Then they took on the number 22 BYU Cougars at the big house and shut them out 31-0. Then they went to Maryland and blanked the Terrapins 28-0. And then last Saturday... They took on the number 13 Northwestern Wildcats on homecoming, their first Big Ten Conference matchup, and they absolutely shelled the purple and black 38 to nothing. Man. Jim Harbaugh and the Michigan and the and the Michigan defense and the offense it are all coming together as a complete cyborg. The Michigan State Spartans are in for a surprise. The Wolverines have outscored their last four opponents 125-7 to compared to Harbaugh's old team, the San Francisco 49ers, 0-4, being outscored 137-55. to Poor Colin Kaepernick. So so I found the article here. I'm going to tweet it right now cuz it ha I still haven't tweeted it yet. This one was written by Brad Rowland of Fan Buzz, headlining Michigan opens as a significant and surprising betting favorite over Michigan State. Vegas has favored Michigan. The Michigan Wolverines are rolling right now on the heels of a three consecutive uh, shutouts. Uh, Michigan comes comes up at number twelve in the AP and, and number fourteen in the coaches' bowl. 
but Las Vegas is favoring Michigan by nearly a touchdown in their in-state rival in-state arch rival contest against the green and white. Some and now as as uh, as written on this article by by Roland, some will quote, some will still view this as an upset of the Wolverines are able to unseat the Spartans. But um, the way the Wolverines are playing right now and the way the Spartans are playing their last their first uh <coughs> their first six or five games Spartans are still un Spartans are still undefeated by the way but they're barely hanging on against mediocre teams like Central Michigan Purdue Rutgers and other teams like those. But um, Michigan State will be in for a much greater challenge at Michigan Stadium in Ann, in Ann Arbor this Saturday. That game kicks off at 3.30 on BTN. And I should able to set it to record if I have to work overtime. Uh, let me go on here and see if... No, that's it. Uh, Todd Furman on Twitter, at Todd Furman, tweeted, College Football Week 7 via Dave, Ma Dave Mason, BOL. Stanford, minus 5 versus UCLA. Utah, minus 6.5 versus ASU, Arizona State. OU, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, at, at minus 5.5 at Kansas State. Notre Dame minus three versus USC, who fired their head coach just a few hours ago. Michigan is six is minus six point five versus Michigan State, and LSU minus seven and a half versus Florida, or or something or UF. Florida is FU, uh, Florida University. I think I I don't I don't know. Uh, it's it's. It's probably UF. Uh, forget about it. The focus is on Michigan and Michigan State. It's the Detroit sports truth, not the national sports truth. It's the Detroit sports truth. I gotta stick to my teams, but I gotta be truthful. Uh, yeah, it's uh, there's not much written on there, but I will give you the matchups. On these bad boys here. Nick Schratz commented on my Facebook page, Taylor Phillips's Detroit Sports page, with a photo. Uh, he, and uh, of uh, Michigan State stats against Rutgers, and he is a huge Michigan State fan, a hopeful, a very hopeful Michigan State fan, hoping that, hoping and having faith that the Spartans will beat the Wolverines on the road. Connor Cook was twenty-three of thirty-eight, three hundred fifty-seven yards, two touchdowns. Uh, Shalik Calhoun, four tackles, three solo, 
a half of a a half a sack. Aaron Burbridge, Aaron Burbridge, nine catches, 146 yards, 16.2 average. And L.J. Scott, nine attempts, 42 yards, two touchdowns. Third multi-touchdown performance this year. And Michigan State at Michigan will be highlighted by ESPN College Game Day presented by the Home Depot late in the, in the late morning hours from 10 a.m. to noon. Kickoff at 3.30. Spartan fans can tune into the Spartan Sports Network with George Blaha and Jason Strayhorn. Wolverine fans will tune into Jim Brandstatter and Dan Deerdorf on the Michigan IMG Sports Network. Speaking of the Wolverines, J.U. Chesson kicked out the scoring right away on the first play of the game with a 97 yard uh, with a 96 yard touchdown kickoff return. First game opening kickoff return for a touchdown since Tyrone Wheatley in 1992. 99 yards versus Houston. Wowzers, as Inspector Gadget would say. Scoring in all phases, U of M offense 21, special teams 10, defense 7, Northwestern 0. The last offensive and defensive and special teams touchdowns in one game was 2003 versus Indiana at the Big House. More points, 38 was more points scored than Northwestern allowed in its five previous games combined, 35. So it's a three-point positive dent- a three-point positive differential. The defense, uh, first time with three straight shutouts since 1980. Michigan has outscored their opponents 97-0 over the three-game stretch, 41 straight defensive possessions without a score. How long can the streak continue until that? until it's over. Michigan improves to 88-27-0, all-time in homecoming games, winning 17 of its last 21. The attendance, 110,452. Michigan has forced a total of 32 three-and-outs this season, 5.3 per game. And the red zone efficiency leads the Big Ten, 3-for-3 in the red zone, 19-for-20, 95% on the season. And that's it. I would say, I say Michigan defense keeps on going, but but, uh, finally allows at least three or seven points. I pick uh, uh, Michigan 45, Michigan State 10, a surprising route. To some, to some not to the non-Vegas fans here, but to true Wolverines fans here, it would not be as surprising as others would think. Michigan State's defense has been uh, laboring, but their offense, ke- but their offense keeps getting it, getting the job done, just barely. Their last game at Rutgers, the Scarlet Knights spiked the ball on fourth down with four seconds left. They normally they could have won it with a hail mary on fourth down, but I don't think. But that, but that's normally a smaller, a very small chance anyway. I guess, I guess coincidentally, Rutgers had to give up. A field goal. Would not have would not have tied it. They were down seven. But uh, Michigan State's defense has to pick it back up. I know they miss Pat Narduzzi. I know they miss Pat Pat Narduzzi, their def- their old defensive coordinator. But that's not an excuse. 
that's a whiny excuse. But but at least I don't hear them complaining about it. But I still think Michigan will win forty five to ten. And Nick Schratz, thank you so much for uh one half for your Spartan half of this priest of this um matchup. I had the Wolverines uh half of the matchup. And I love both teams. I'm I'm not just a Michigan fan, I'm a state fan as well. I, I I'm more of a Chippewa. My Chippewa sucked this year. They they barely held on against they barely they just barely lost 41-39 to Western Michigan at Waldo Stadium, the Broncos. Chippewas are now 2-4 and four overall, 1-1 one and one in the conference. Chippewas have, uh, have John Bonamigo as fir- in his first season as head coach. Trying to trying to improve the maroon and gold to great back to greatness. Thus far, they're they're going the other way. They're going backwards. It's not what we want here. So finally, we go to the Tigers. That one is long gone. I just got a source earlier today that. Tigers general manager Al Avila let me look for it here it could be in the score that 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 uh, came from yesterday Al Avila says he is not considering bringing out his son catcher Alex Avila back. Come on, where is it? Dang it. No, it's here somewhere. I'm not I'm not going to give up here. Okay, I'll look at look for it on the computer, stupid phone. It says here Al Avila says re signing Alex Avila is not a priority. And he expects the catcher to sign elsewhere. From Chris Iot of MLive.com. He said, uh, Al Avila said that during a Thursday meeting, that our, that news broke out thir- last Thursday during a season-ending meeting with media members. Alex Avila hit 191 with 13 RBIs and a 626 OPS this year. That's terrible. He drew more walks, 40, than he had hits, 34, in limited playing time in 2015. Avila was injured, but that has nothing to do with his uh, lack of performance. Alex Avila is hitting very inconsist- has been hitting very inconsistently the last three or four years. That Avila's time in Detroit is done. It the Tiger. It says here in Ayat's article the Tigers would likely prefer to have a veteran catcher of any kind. Can't name one yet. Specifically, one who hits left-handed to back up McCann. They're trying to. Are they trying to look for a guy that's? That's more similar to Alex Avila. Are you out of your mind? Illogical. I, I just. I, 
I just don't. I just don't think that's a good idea. I just don't. James McCann stood to be the number one catcher, in my opinion. Brian Holiday even played played pretty good last last season this calendar year. <clears throat> McCann hit two sixty four with seven home runs, forty one RBIs, and and a six eighty three OPS. Holiday hit two two eighty one. It's even better. 18th for 64, 745 OPS in limited playing time for the Tigers in 2015. Career-wise, he's hitting 251 with a 622 OPS and 259 career at-bats in the majors. All those statistics for Holiday are in the majors. If the Tiger says here, the Tigers would also have to waste signing a veteran versus possibly losing Holiday, who is out of options and would have to clear waivers is that if the Tigers would have to clear waivers if the Tigers try to send him to Triple A Toledo. So uh as far as the Alavila signing expected to sign elsewhere is concerned. Al Avila said that Alex Avila will draw plenty of attention. Alex Avila will draw plenty of attention on the open market, and that it's probably that he has played his final game with the Tigers. And I I agree with Al Avila's decision there. Of Al's probably going to let Alex go, and it's just a business decision. It's not. It's not a family decision. It's not personal. It's just business. It's it's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. So for those of you Tigers fans that are still coddling to Al Avila and Alex Avila's uh, staying as a whole, You can coddle them all you want. You're just a crybaby, a coward! I... You must not be thinking clearly. So, it's... Time to move on. I guess we have come to the point where, you know, it is now time for the five questions segment. It's time for five questions with Taylor the Gator Phillips. Question number one, very simple. Do the Lions need a clean house before or after their regular season ends? Question number two, who do you think shall... uh, Take over possession of the Lions franchise, Bill Ford Jr. or Lewis uh, Perez, Luis Perez. Bill Ford Jr. or Luis Perez. Question number three. How must the Red Wings power play improve? Question number four. Will the Pistons' first preseason win give them momentum, give them enough momentum to have a winning season and make the NBA playoffs next calendar year. Next calendar year. And question number five. 
Should James McCann be the number one catcher with Brian Holiday backing backing him up? Wait, I take that back. Should James McCann be uh, be the number one catcher with a veteran as a backup? If so, who should it be? Name one. Name the best one. Do your homework and not and don't just give out give out your guessing opinion. I need more homework, please. And thank you. So I thought I would uh, save the five questions for last. So uh, that that's going to do it for episode 170 uh, on the Detroit Sports Truth on Spreaker, also on iHeartRadio. I'm Taylor Phillips. If there's anything you fans want more of or less of on my podcast, please let me know. And thank you. ETFN, ta-ta for now. Bon appétit.